Hey everybody, welcome to Insufferable Bastards. My name is Carlos Danger and I'm joined by my co-host, Mr. Brian Spears. Hello, Brian! Hello, hello. So this is episode 239 of Insufferable Woo. Bastards. Yeah, 239. Uh, this episode is titled The Bastard Children of Harry Knowles. In this episode, we're going to play 11 clips, I hope. This might not go as planned. 11 <laughs> clips from a great podcast called Download, The Rise and Fall of Harry Knowles and Ain't It Cool News. That podcast, by the way, this is right from their website, podcast description, blah, blah, blah. Download is a deep dive audio documentary. Sounds fancy. Series, documentary series that explores the morally complicated, occasionally inspiring, and often forgotten oral histories of the internet. Now, specifically during this episode of Our Insufferable Bastards, we're going to pull clips from episode five called The Ghost of Neil Cumpston. So one thing, like I, I just off the bat, you should go seek out this podcast. Again, it's download the rise and fall of Harry Knowles and ain't it cool news. I did not think I would like this podcast. The Apple, from what I remember, and I could be wrong. I hope I'm not. I didn't double check this and I can't right now. But like the stars or whatever, the the ratings on Apple podcasts were a little like, eh. But I realize now it's probably from people, you know, this this podcast is is about it's a little too close. It hits too close to home. Yeah. It's a little bit about fanboy culture. To a certain there, you know, it, it's a great. So I, I could understand why people might give it less stars than it deserves because they are uh, fanboys anyway. Yeah, uh, but it's good journalism. Like this is this guy, the guy that did it. Uh, and I, I have his name somewhere, but it's 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 I don't see it right now. But it, he 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 approaches it journalistically, like it's fair, it's balanced, because he is a fan of of comic book movies and all that good stuff but it's enlightening like i had no idea about harry knowles harry knowles uh that whole website ain't cool news i didn't know anything about that other than like he was a bit uh, of a creeper and okay. that's all yeah. i knew yeah so this tells a whole story it's just what it says it, what is you're playing it oh uh, i was just trying to look now. for the guy's name and i couldn't uh and now you can't turn button. it off <laughs> But so like, why are we, why are we doing this? Why do we choose this particular episode? Can you, you, you can't turn off your phone. You have not know how to do this. <laughs> I'm just gonna, there I'm glad go. this isn't pornography, but I've been annoyed lately, like angry and frustrated because in general, I bet I'm annoyed at a lot of things, but I feel Brian, that people are ignoring great content, whether it be movies or television programs. And you brought it up. You put the seed in my brain a couple of weeks back because you were wondering several times during a particular episode why more people weren't talking about Winning Time, the HBO show about the rise of the Lakers dynasty. And we both have said it's one of the most exciting ensemble dramedies to hit a screen of any size in years go people should go back and listen if you haven't seen it go go back and listen to a, a couple episodes ago and, and hear us talk about it it's a great show it just hands down it's a great show yeah. I, it's weird that i feel defensive about it but that's the problem with our culture today now that show ended its first season and now there's a new show on hbo called we own this city yeah. a show that in general chronicles police corruption in baltimore it's a sort of sequel in spirit to the wire generally Maybe a little regarded, easier to understand too for uh the wire is generally regarded as the greatest show of all time yeah but right so far we own this city is a simpler more contained story whereas the wire was this epic study in institutions and communities but that's all beside the point what really got me angry is where are all those people who were jumping for joy about the opening credits of Peacemaker. There was all that hype leading up to Peacemaker being like, it's the greatest show opening of all time. Like, and I'd say that the obsession over Peacemaker was incredible. 
for all those weeks. So where are all the people that anointed that show an instant classic? Peacemaker, Winning Time, and We Own This City are all on HBO Max. You and I have watched or are watching them all. Them all, yes. But where are all the so-called movie critics from YouTube and Apple Podcasts weighing in on We Own This City? They all talked about the Book of Boba Fett, as, as we did. They all talked about Peacemaker every episode or mid-season or did it wrap up so they were previewed it. But they're now quiet. Why are so many people willing to watch and weigh in on comic book content such as Peacemaker? Yet there's even a phrase now for shows like We Own This City and Winning Time. It's called, they call them dad shows. Really? That's how, yeah, because we're old. Brian and I are 48 year old white men. They refer to them as dad shows. Oh, see, I, but, I find that offensive. I'm not so, even a father. Right. <laughs> So that's a question. And like, why is our pop culture so obsessed with content? Well, maybe these like some of that. these other 48 year old fans should be watching dad shows rather than teen, you know, dramas that, you know, are just comic book stories from, you know, when they were little kids. And they're not only and I we like Peacemaker. We were fine with it. Like, we had well, critiques. I will say we, I like watch it, liked it. It was it was entertaining. I didn't like but the now, opening. What'd you say? I didn't like the opening. That was the one thing. Well, we'll get into sort of this 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 hype machine that happens. There's also so much content now that comes out that people obsess over that. Come on, it's not it's not worth your time. It's and being my, the, watered the down. Example, to me. The, my example is going to be why was the internet and podcasters and YouTube freaking out about She Hulk coming to the Disney Channel? Like, why is everyone having the exact same conversa conversation about that trailer. Why on YouTube are there a thousand and one videos with titles like the She-Hulk is an abdomation, abomination, sorry, whatever that word is. Disney Marvel is a dumpster fire. That has almost, almost 200,000 views. Woke Disney dumpster fire, She-Hulk, MCU, 39,000 views. Matt Walsh, the douchebag blogger, Reacts to Marvel's She Hulk trailer, 178,000 views. Doctor wow. Strange, too, right? This week it was She Hulk, two or three weeks ago. <sighs> Doctor Strange Part Two. All right, fine. There's a new Doctor Strange movie. It's directed by Sam Raimi. Who cares? Why, is, why does that everybody have to talk about that? How did the culture get to this point where movies and to a rapidly growing extent, television are pretty much dominated by three IPs? The fact we even yeah. know what IP means uh, depresses me to no end. You got Star Wars, you got Marvel, and you got DC. Now, the answer is not as simple as the knee jerk. Well, they make money. As long as they make money, they're going to make these movies. And that's where this podcast we're going to talk about comes in the rise and fall of Harry Knowles. Now, it's not an anti-Marvel podcast in no. any way. But we're going to talk specifically about episode five, where it helps to literally explain how we went from a certain type of view in our culture to now just being comic book movies all the time or superhero movies all the time. And keep in mind that the host creator director, I don't know if director is the right word, editor of this podcast is a Marvel movie fan. He loves yeah, yeah. his his big tent movies. And he lists a bunch of comic book movies towards the end of the episode where he's and like, he hey, I really like this one. I like All this one and I like this one. But it's like I, I just found this podcast really enlightening because I it helped me to understand why we are where we are, because I, I complain about it every single week. We had and, and one of the other inspirations for this podcast is we had on our on our Facebook page, the Insufferable Podcast Facebook page, Johnny Ganache from The Pint. It just changed its name. It's no longer Pint of Comics. It's called The Pint. He said, I dare you to go through an entire episode without mentioning Marvel movies. So, of course, now what we're going to do is dedicate an entire <laughs> episode to talking about Marvel movies because, you know, we are insufferable bastards. But my point being like, no, we should talk about this. 
I want to I wanted to explore why this makes me so angry, what my problem is beyond just being like, well, your average pod, your average podcaster has crappy taste. It's it's yeah. deeper than that. Uh, so like I'm saying, oh, and by the way, I finally got this. The, the, the podcast, the Harry Knowles podcast, the rise and fall of Harry Knowles download, right? It's written, edited, and narrated by Joe Scott. That's the guy's name. Sorry about that. It's just hugely informative. And like I said, I never read Ain't It Cool News on a regular basis. I was aware that the Harry dude was out there, but I was pretty much ignorant of it. Brian, I think you were too, right? Did you ever oh, read listen, that I mean, website? Do, do I don't, I'm ignorant to what we're doing right now. I mean, I think people have said, wait, me, what does that mean? That well, again, I don't know what the heck uh, how to set anything up. It took me a half hour just to turn the damn computer on just to start before. Oh. I, I don't know anything. I don't go to any sites. But I, I mean, people would send me like, hey, one of my movies got on an eight at cool news. I um, guess, you know, that actually and I don't mean to interrupt you, but yeah, we should talk for a second about our own backgrounds. Right. Because that that plays a part because I was working in newspapers when ain't it cool news came around. Right. I was yeah. I graduated. I mean, I've been now a reporter continuously full time employed without any break for 24 years. Right. Since 1998. Brian's a special effects makeup artist who's been doing it even longer than that. Yeah, so, wow. so when ain't it new, ain't it cool news came, came around. Well, I was trying to learn how like local government works and how to like report. It, I, it wasn't, I, as, as we've always been movie fans. So like Brian and yes. I have always been movie fans. I think in this period in our lives, when that this podcast talks about, we were busy trying to get into our professions and try to find some stability and try to pay the bills and ham and egg it in and all that good stuff. But Brian and I, we grew up together, literally. Yes. We did a high school newspaper movie review together in 1990. You know, I did. And movie we still get people. School. We still get people that like, remember our reviews. Well, one, high school. Per, one well, person. Hey, and well, a couple well, of years come back. on, let's just, you know, make it sound bigger than it is. But like I was a guy and I should say this, like I was, I knew who my local movie reviewer was. I knew who Marshall Fine was, right? In addition, like I have the 1990 Roger Ebert movie home companion behind me. I would get that every single year. I loved movie critics. I loved reading the Daily News, the New York Post every day, the New York Times on Sunday, specifically for the movie reviews. We both would read Fangoria, Premiere, later Film Threat, yep. Movie Line. I remember Joe Queenan was a writer. So we were... I don't want to be like esoteric or conceited, but we were like students of movies. Like we watched a lot of. Movies. Oh, yeah. Yes. We were obsessed. Were we geeks? I guess so. I don't know. But we never read comic books. I read comic never, books never. when I was a little kid, real little, like first grade, second grade. I had the Pope, Pope John Paul comic. You know, I have one comic that's apparently worth money. I had an early Wolverine. You had a, a Wolverine number three, if I believe correctly. I, I read them. I, I read them passively. And I only say that to establish our, our, our own backgrounds, right? So I'm still a reporter uh, and Brian is a special effects uh, makeup artist. So, so we kind of missed this. That's why I thought this podcast was a learning experience because I was in newspapers seeing newspaper oh. reporters get laid off all the time. Oh, oh, and when, yeah. they had, when they had professional movie critics, I, I, I saw that disappear. I didn't really, I knew, okay, the internet's coming and they're doing layoffs and, and, and they're not hitting revenue anymore, but I more blamed it on the corporations. I had no idea what was happening in this other world with sort of, I, I don't want to, well, I'm going to say it, like scummy sites like Ain't It Cool News. Well, and I, I knew from our friend Glenn that it was yeah. out there, but was this was a learning experience for me this podcast and this episode specifically i always say this i can't trust a guy who loves a jason movie if he's never seen the godfather i'm he could still love jason but he's never seen the godfather you well, know yeah that's true and i guess that's what i was sort of i don't know i don't want to sound like a conceited jerk but well, i mean yeah, i get it I, I could, if brian I, if... and i have both seen a lot of movies we always sought out movies we would watch i mean i know i read roger ebert and i would I, before the internet i would seek out if he gave some random movie five stars i would go seek it out reservoir dogs discovered through f through you know movie critics in newspapers it was really yeah all the different movies fangoria henry portrait of a serial killer yeah. there was a whole ecosystem out there where you could discover all types of different movies and you're right it wasn't just waiting about waiting for the next friday the 13th to come out and we were horror fans too yeah 
Uh, and this, this podcast sort of talks about that change. This podcast for me helped to explain, give me a better understanding of what the culture, how the culture got to the point where we are now, where it comes with this obsession with superhero movies, how like there's thousands and thousands of podcasts out there about MCU and this and that. So I, I guess what we'll do is I was going to play some clips okay. from episode five, right? Of download the rise and fall of Harry Knowles and ain't it cool news. And maybe we can just play these clips. These are clips that just struck me that stuck out, stuck out to me and I'll play them. And I guess we can just react to them. So, so here's the first one. This is from uh, early on in episode five and it features a quote from a guy named uh, Rene Rodriguez and he was a former newspaper critic for the Miami Herald. This is a guy that loves Paula uh, Paula Pauline Kale Pauline who was, Kale. Yeah, I'm sorry. Who, who was a movie critic who was like the preeminent. I never read her. I wasn't that fancy, so I'm not going to like play that off. But she's the preeminent. Uh, she got every critic. Roger Altman movie higher up the ladder. Like she was a big proponent of Robert Altman. Hugely, hugely influential. So here, here uh, is the dude talking about that. Let's see if this will work. In the world. From the moment he first read one of her books, Rene Rodriguez became a lifelong fan of Pauline Kael. And there was one quote by Kael in particular that Rene remembers more than any other. Pauline Kael had a really famous quote where somebody asked her, you know, what's the role of a critic, of a movie critic anyway? And she said, the movie critic is the only thing standing between you and the advertising department of a studio that's releasing. If you remove the critic from that equation and a movie comes out, there's nobody in between. As far yes. So yeah. on this very podcast with like our former uh, third host, Joe Greenberg, he would often disparage critics. Yes. And uh, it would get me mad. But like there, right there is a reason why critics were important. That's what critics used to be. Film criticism was a skill. It was. It took work. It would be edited. So uh, to me, I just wanted to play that because it's important. And this episode in particular talks about, it chronicles, while, while the podcast in general is about creepy Harry Knowles and how his personality came onto the scene and he had huge success and was hugely influential in the movie business for a couple of years and then spectacularly imploded in a series of uh, sexual... Uh, harassment allegations, and he had no ethics professionally as a, as a reporter or journalist, and that did him in as well. That's the general theme of this podcast, right? It almost plays like a true crime documentary. It reminded me extent. of the one that... Uh, but uh, this the, particular the episode is talking about how criticism went from printed movie reviewers who had training in what they did to anybody with like us with a podcast with a microphone. So I'm sorry, what were you saying? No, 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 just go on. All right. So there was the first clip about the dude talking about what Pauline Kale made and it defines what a movie critic is supposed to be. That was the old fashioned definition. And then they talk about early in this episode, the changes that have taken place. The changes that Renee is referring to happened in the mid to late 2000s. That's when dozens of professional, salaried newspaper film critics from around the country were laid off or reassigned by newspapers that had employed them for decades. Rene himself hung on longer than most. He was reassigned by the Miami Herald to write about real estate in 2018. With print film critics becoming all but extinct, that void in cinema culture would ultimately be filled with hundreds of online film critics, or in most cases, film enthusiasts. I love that phrase, Brian, film, film enthusiast, because it finally put a name to what I feel. I listen to some like on YouTube, there's all these film critics. My son has started to get into movies and criticism in a way. He's in uh, sixth grade and it, I get annoyed a little bit because there's like this guy, Chris Stuckman, and, and, you know, he gets a ton of, of views on YouTube. But the way they review movies First of all, everyone has like, they got their toys in the background, right? Which is fine. They all have like, the, but it's all like their Marvel stuff and their Captain America, whatever in the background and their comic books, which is all right. And then whatever movie they were reviewing, if they're doing Captain America, well, then they have to have their Captain America t-shirt on. And it's like, you know, not to be an old man, but all right. So you're, that's a form of bias. Like I just, it just, the whole, the whole I, thing is like, how can I, 
how can I trust your opinion on what you're about to review when you're already telling me you have this enthusiasm for the content you're about to talk about? You know, and so I, I just thought that was a great phrase, movie enthusiasts. Uh, and then the next clip I was going to play, they start to talk about how you had all the print reporters get laid off and television as well. Yeah. Even like local news guys. It's not just, uh, but, 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 you know, the, the print journalists, there were a lot of them. Every local newspaper, no matter the size, had a movie reviewer. And I should say, like, I did that stuff. You know, I worked at, in, in, in these years, I worked at a weekly paper. I was a government reporter, but I also finagled my way into writing movie reviews. And just to give you a hint or an idea how difficult it was to even get into that line of work, I was at a weekly, we were owned by the Daily. Their critic was, one of them was the guy, Marshall Fine, who Brian and I got an award yeah. from for writing movie reviews, right? The, it wasn't greeted warmly when I started to write movie reviews for the weekly that was owned by the Daily. Like that was, didn't go over well. And eventually I was asked to stop because, uh, you know, that's and I'm sure, competitive within there. That's how, that's how like important the job was. And I'm sure you was. weren't making a killing writing reviews for the movies. You know what I mean? Like I got, no, I, my, my salary was uh, my starting salary was $24,000 a year. Yeah, in so it, that's it's like you were doing making. that just out of the love of getting to watch a movie and being honest about writing that, you know, about, you know, reviewing that movie. It wasn't like to get your career going. It was like, this is give yourself a little and, fun at work. Yeah. You know, you had to like, even at a little rinky dink weekly that I was at, it passed through three layers of editing, yeah. you know, and then you'd get, you get reaction to letters. People would call you if they didn't like your review or they had the, you know, you had to be, you couldn't just say anything. You know, it was it was time consuming. It was professional and it was a, a bit of a craft and you couldn't just. You, and, and the other thing, like what blows my mind, and it's like a pet peeve I have about some movie reviewers, you know, when you write something, you don't have unlimited space. So you'd always try to summarize the plot as quickly as possible. And it was almost like a how could you shorten the plot to the punchiest, most readable it's Summer. like a pitch. You want a pitch. It's got to be like the, the movie plot doesn't pitch. matter. People, yeah. you're not you're not going over the movie. You're just trying to recommend. You know, you want to give little. You don't want to give it away, but you want to tell people what the movie's about. But the majority of the review is supposed to be your reaction and why. And nowadays, like I, I read some reviews on like Rotten Tomatoes, and it's like they give they just go through plot. They just they just plot. go through they the go, entire. They go plot. through the movie scene by scene, scene by scene, as if that's a review. And that is not movie criticism because it's been cheapened. And here's further proof. But as Jeremy Smith, one of the better former writers at Ain't It Cold News, could tell you, many of his peers who wrote about movies for his and other websites left something to be desired. There was a cheapening of film criticism because so many people could have a voice. And there were so many people, even today, you look at Rotten Tomatoes and there are people, it's like, I'll read their reviews. And it's like, you, you, you know, you've seen maybe a, a few hundred movies and you Yes. Yes. Yeah. You haven't done the work is what I just cut out. The last thing he says is you haven't done the work. Yeah. There is something to be said by that. Like I know you, everyone has entitled to their opinion and you can't get mad at people who haven't seen like the Godfather or some of the <sighs> staples. But then again, there's this weird thing that happens on Twitter. And that's where a lot of my frustration comes from. Cause I I'm on the insufferable bastards podcast, Twitter a lot. And, you know, people will say, Listen, you can disagree with me about a movie, but if you haven't put in the time and seen the whole, like every damn movie made in the 70s or at least hit all the high points of it, you have no right. Don't tell me my, my, my taste stinks yeah. if you've never seen a whole bunch of movies, you know? And if you're seeing it for the first time now and then you're telling me, well, I didn't really like that. Well, that's because you grew up wrong. Your yeah. tastes are warped. If your whole life is eating Takis and that's all you know, and then you have a steak, it's going to be weird to you. Yes. You know, and it really, it really bothers me. There's this, and the other thing I have with like just the, the internet and, and modern criticism in general and Rotten Tomatoes specifically is the arrogance of people who just think their poop doesn't stink. The problem with film enthusiasts is in this next clip where I love that phrase, film enthusiasts, <sighs> who have sort of gotten to this place where we're all talking about the same thing. I think the problem I had with the fanboy reviewers is that they didn't become more critical. 
yeah. because they stuck to the kinds of films that they liked instead of being, well, like a generalist like me. That's film critic Betsy Pickle. From 1984 to 2008, Betsy reviewed movies for the Knoxville News Sentinel. So I just wanted to credit her. Yeah, but how great is that, Brian? You were saying that, too. Yeah, like I, the whole thing with like the, the problem with what we see nowadays with uh, podcasts and, and film reviewers on YouTube, especially the new media guys, especially who aren't maybe affiliated, is that they're all waiting for the same thing to review. It's the same movie they're reviewing or go again over and over and over and over and over, and over again. But they just they're, they're into the movie that is marketed to be the lowest common uh, like the, the movies they're in love with are so corporate driven too. see, I have an issue, too. I think a lot of this is some of these movies. These big tentpole movies are not directed movies. They're made by committees, a director like everyone brings a big deal about uh, Sam Raimi being the director of that Doctor Strange movie. Sure, he's the du- director, but he ha- he's not the one that called all those shots. There's executives above him that told him exactly what to do. Sure, he picked the lenses and, and created the scenes. But if he would have veered off in a weird direction, that's that's why you hear all these people, these big franchise movies getting fired. Right. And it, yeah. The, and then it was Doctor Strange, too, specifically. And I'm speculating. I have not seen the movie. Not me neither. But, you know, it's like, is it a Sam Raimi movie? Sure. Did he get paid a lot of money for that? Sure. It, did he have final cut over it? No. Was no. He told, and, and I think he's even said, like, what did he have to get certain things in there? Yes. And we'll, we'll talk about Doctor Strange towards the end of this podcast because it's interesting to read some of the reviews uh, of that movie. But yeah, is that a Sam Raimi movie? I don't know. The other thing about Sam Raimi is like he made he, he never listen. Uh, listen, I'm, as the horror guy of the podcast, he never wanted to make horror movies. He made a horror movie one time. It did incredibly well. It probably pigeonholed him into a career at in the beginning that he wanted out of. Yeah, he wanted to make different movies. I'm not saying he didn't want to make, you know, and you know what? Know he wanted to make Spider-Man at that time. I would say, like, if somebody gave Sam Raimi a hundred million dollars to make a superhero movie and then walked away, I would I'd be willing to I would I would greet that less skeptically. Is that a word? Skeptically? I would greet that with less skepticism than I am with Doctor Strange, too, because I don't care about Doctor Strange, yeah. too. I just I'm not interested in it. It's no different than like Moon Knight, which I just watched the whole thing of. And oh God, that was so awful. I'm but um, what would you say? I'm trying you, to get trying through to, that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's just I, Listen, you know, I, that's the other thing. We as much as people yell at us for, oh, you guys are so anti Marvel. We do watch it all. But why can't we be honest saying this sucks? Or why can't I tell you that I see right through this? This is just marketing movie stuff. Like right. There not- is a weird thing that, that happens. And again, I think this is why this particular uh, podcast, Download the Rise and Fall of Harry Newell's and Ain't It Cool, cool News, might not have the stars it deserves because there is a backlash when you go out there and you you sort of complain about this mainstream Marvel stuff. You're allowed to you can have a podcast and you'll be celebrated by if you have a podcast that's exclusively about Marvel stuff. But if you sort of explore is this kind of weird guys there is a there is a backlash i also think there should be in the in in cinema there there is a place for every uh, superhero movie my complaint is is do we need this much of it and can't you guys see that we aren't getting the best we're getting you know there's just not there's not enough good writers to write and great and, stories and just like a, a little uh we'll, we'll we'll blow through this but I think I'm going to play a clip towards the end. It does seem like maybe something started. I, I have a feeling that maybe, you know, I'm like that dude listening for the train. You put your ear to the, uh, the, the, the tracks. tracks. Yeah. Maybe something's starting to change. Uh, but here is another clip from episode five of Download the Rise and Fall of Harry Knowles and Ain't It Cool News, where basically talk about like, you know, Pulp Fiction. We know that movie got made because of, of critics to some extent. Yeah. Pickle again. I mean, that was the glory era of Miramax. And We're talking about the 90s here. Yep. Fine Line and, and so many good movies. Miramax and Fine Line were among the film distributors that devoted themselves almost exclusively to independent and foreign films. Movies created by filmmakers as popular as Quentin Tarantino, Gus Van Sant, and Steven Soderbergh. They also distributed films by lesser known but extremely challenging auteurs like Todd Solondz, Harmony Korine, and Terry Zweigoff, nearly all of whom produced films that could no longer be made today. 
in part because of the subject matter of their movies, but also because the systems for financing, distribution, and marketing have all but completely disintegrated. Yeah. So uh, I know, Brian, you've made that point before. Hey, do you remember like we, you and I went to a Todd Solon's movie, Happiness, I want to say, oh, yeah. in a theater, like in an art theater, too. So that's what I'm saying. We, and listen, I don't think we walked. I think we both walked out of there asking, like, what did we just watch? It's a very weird movie. Um, but so, yeah, those one theater, those one or two theater art houses there. I mean, at least as far as I know, maybe they still exist in Manhattan, but they're pretty much gone. I, gone I mean, yeah. I, I used to go alone a lot in like my uh, last year of college, my first couple of years of college, I would just wander around and, you know, see all these like weird documentaries at these random places. Uh, yeah. And those are, are, are all gone as well. And yeah, you could, you could see there was a whole buffet of these movies. It, I mean, you could argue, I, and I get that it still exists to streaming to some extent, sort of, but if you look at Netflix, but, definitely but not here's, on Netflix. I just had a filmmaker over my house on last Saturday. We're talking about making a movie together. Here's the thing. There is a huge world out there. But the problem is, is people will only scroll. Most people won't hit the search button and type the movie in. They will scroll. So if your movie is at the, is is past like a, a certain point, people aren't scrolling that far. Will, it's out there. It's out there to it. find. But it's almost like that's where, you know, we always talk about the longing of a video store. You could walk and physically see it. This is. We are so overloaded. When you look at your TV screen, you have four rows of movies. You have to go left or right to get to more of them. But some you don't see something soon enough. You just go down to the next heading, the next category, and, and scroll to a certain point. You really, the, yes, there are a ton of great movies out there to get and watch so, and with a ton of variety. But you have to I actually think you have to look more because there's so much out. There. It's very tough to get. And the other thing going on in this podcast episode talks about it to some extent and, and some other episodes as well of this, of this particular podcast. The Harry Knowles one I'm talking about, not us. But there's also this pressure. From uh, website writers, and I would even say in like little podcasts like us. We all want to talk about something that's going to that people are interested in to get clicks on. You want and like people I think about it. We did uh, what was that one right before the CT Horror Fest in twenty twenty? Just earlier this year, the uh, Malignant. Yes, yes, yes. That's when I was like, "Why are we talking about Malignant?" Like, and the only reason I saw that movie was just to talk about it on this podcast, right? And that, if you think about it, that's sort of evil because we're all doing that, you know. It, we talked about, I mean, we talked about Arkansas once a guy. Oh my God. We still get crap for talking about Arkansas, you know, and it's, it's among our lowest uh, downloads, but the one movie I want to talk about, oh, well, there is a movie I want to talk about, but we'll bring it up on the next episode. Cause I know yeah, it's, well, yeah, let's try to keep one episode. Yeah. What were you, just, you can, name I just it. want to do X because I know we both disagree on it. So I want to talk about that. And that's a new movie, but, oh, but again, that's, right. that's a new movie. No one's talking about. Well, yeah, nobody wants to talk about X. Nobody wants to talk about, like we said, the, the, like there's uh, it seems like we might be entering at least another golden age of dad TV, allegedly, uh, whatever you want to call it. But the other thing here, here's another clip. And this is uh, this is probably not news to, to anybody. But, you know, Patton Oswalt famously was on Parks and Rec. Well, this was news to me, this thing. He, well, well, no, I'm not going into. All right. So Patton Oswalt. Yeah, I had no idea that Patton Oswalt was a ghostwriter under the name of Neil Cumston on Ain't It Cool News. And basically he would write these outrageous, politically incorrect, vulgar reviews of movies mocking Harry Knowles, who seriously wrote bizarre, yeah. horribly written uh, movie reviews. And I guess most famously, and I had no idea, Blade 2. He describes Blade 2 and Guillermo del Toro as a sex act, as cunnilingus, right? Which is it's just it's just so bizarre. But so yeah, that you know, go listen to this podcast if you don't know any of that. But uh Patton Oswald also famously was on Parks and Rec and he went through this whole and at the time it was just like look this geeky like rant filibuster he did at a local town hall meeting, right? But it is so funny to go back and listen this to is that 13 filib- years old. This is right. 13 years old or something it, like that. Something I'll, like I'll that. Yeah, that. it's a, yeah, it's got to be like a decade. I mean, I only saw Parks and Rec within the, probably since the pandemic began. But you listen to the rant now and all of it rings true. It, it, there's not even comedy in it at this point. Yeah. I should note really quickly that Patton Oswalt declined to be interviewed for the story, which is a shame, but also understandable. 
Even if his work as Neil Cumpson was intended purely as satire, Patton has clearly grown a lot in terms of his work as a comedian. He probably has zero interest in revisiting this chapter from his past. But if we did talk, I would have asked Patton if maybe he was channeling the ghost of Neil Cumpson in the character that he played on the Town Hall filibuster episode he did for the NBC sitcom Parks and Recreation. The following is an outtake of the filibuster Patton gave in this episode. It was during this filibuster that Patton describes the potential of a Disney-produced crossover between the Star Wars and Avengers franchises. We see Thanos, who was the oh, villain on. teased at the end of the first Avengers movie. Now, Thanos, as you know, owns the Infinity Gauntlet, which has the Time Gem, the Mind Gem, as the Power know. Gem, the Space Gem, and the Reality Gem. If he holds the Reality Gem, that means he can jump from different realities. This will be our link from, to the Marvel Universe, from the Star Wars Universe. Filmed in 2013, Oswald's unhinged tirade is a clear vision of Hollywood that appears to be manifesting in our reality nearly a decade later. And, and not appears. I mean, this is happening. That is, yeah. if you look at the reviews, and we'll talk about this again in a couple of minutes, if you look at the reviews of Doctor Strange, each one of them begins like that quote-unquote unhinged rant. That's reality. Yes. It's also a sadly accurate depiction of much of the cinema discourse that began to shift into the mainstream in the late 2000s, when most full-time newspaper film critics lost their jobs. With the loss of these full-time movie critics, the films, aesthetics, and values of dogged independence that they championed were immediately washed away. They were instead replaced by a devotion to escapism, and in the worst examples, the worship of brands like Marvel. Yes, yes, 1,000 times Yes, the worship of brands. DC Comics, Transformers, and Star Wars, all of which were the property of huge corporations. This was in stark contrast to the kinds of films Felicia Feaster and her peers championed in the 90s. I mean, I'm involved with two critics organizations where there are quite a few, you know, of this younger wave, um, more blog oriented critics. And they have, you know, as much respect for film culture as I do. It's just really different. I feel like you can't help now, but pay lip service to whatever the big movie is that everyone's talking about. And yes. And she's being kind. I think, I think she's sort of checking her punches there, but, uh, Again, and maybe I'm beating a dead horse. I, this just speaks to me. This is eloquently better than I can because I just get on Twitter and rant. We are just re we, we're all just repeating we're commercials. We're and if you look at if you look at Twitter, yes. And uh, you know, we're all talking about She Hulk last week, whether the CGI is good or it's not good, or whether it's woke or not woke. Oh, the problem is we're just advertise. We're just part of the marketing arm. It's not. Why are we? You know, the, oh, a new trailer dropped. I guess I, I get the excitement in that, but when we're all talking about that. All of us. It's overwhelming, and I and I just think sort of bad for the the culture. But here, let's play on. And that's it. With dozens of professional newspaper critics taken out of the picture entirely, many of the amateurs that remained were the children of Harry Knowles, internet movie critics and journalists, many of whom would be referred to as bloggers, who wanted to make as big of a splash as Knowles did with Ain't It Cool News. The difference here is that while paid newspaper film critics wanted, or at the very least were expected, to write about the wide variety of films that were coming out, the mostly white, mostly male bloggers all wrote about the same topics. Comic book movies, horror films, Star Wars, Star Trek, video game movies, and Zack fucking Snyder. It's a huge part of the reason I feel we all now live in a cinematic universe, or cinematic universes rather, that were created in some part by Harry Knowles. Where our conversation about cinema feels completely obsessed, or perhaps even capped, by just a handful of big budgeted movie franchises. Where major directors like Martin Scorsese, Ridley Scott, and Jane Campion are only widely discussed because of the fact that they have all come out and said that they don't care about Marvel or superhero movies. The cinema culture that is all but obsessed with superhero movies is one that former Ain't It Cool News writer Drew McQueenie seems to take some responsibility for today. When you look at where we are pop culture now, what world are we in where Into the Spider-Verse wins an Oscar, where that movie gets made? Although, I mean, that's a pretty good movie. I'm not sure why he uses that one specifically, but I guess he's saying it was such a 
Well, see, inside my, in the in the weeds inside baseball. Film. I think that's a great movie. I think that's a great movie. But here's the thing: I don't think the 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 company had the balls to actually make it live action and make a Black Spider Man. Like it works in animation and it's safer. Like if that's what I'm. Also oh, saying. I kind of feel like I wish all superhero movies were made uh, the way Into the Spider Verse was. Well, Boy, let's I, just play well, it out. I just okay. Where there is a world where the mainstream not only gets the multiverse, has not only seen enough Spider Man to know the difference between them, gets the whole playful. Pre- We've got Miles Morales in a movie now. We've got shit that we can't even fathom when we started doing this. Batman and Robin was the state of the art when this website started. Now look where we are. It's a different world. And we definitely help push the needle towards that world. Right. And now we're at the point where we talked about Arkansas. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and you get, you get uh, derided for it. But, you know, we can still talk about Friday the 13th, part three. Like, that's never been uh, done before. So uh, there's another clip I want to play real fast where they talk about yeah. what is a movie enthusiast, which I just love that term because I think that's what we're all becoming, just movie enthusiasts. We're not having, like, discussions about movies, you know. And sure, they, yeah, there's stuff on Twitter where they're snobs, you know, dissecting cinema and they do shot by shot and, and, and cinematography and all that. But all in all, we're all just re- reacting to commercials. Going back to that movie today is a bit of a mixed bag. The cast was. He's talking about the first X-Men movie. Great. Especially Patrick Stewart yes, and Ian McKellen, well, I mean, heard Professor this, X yeah. and Magneto. Plus the discovery of Hugh Jackman as Wolverine was a revelation. But the very first X-Men film could have been much, much better. However, you would never guess that by reading Harry Knowles' first review of the film. This film is our pilot to the Marvel Universe. In my opinion, this is the most... I'm just going to say, like, I'm interrupting. This is Carlos Danger, by the way. Harry Knowles, like, the, he throws F-bombs around. Like, it just bothers me. It just bothers me. It's creepy. It's creepy when, they, when you throw this many F-bombs around. Accurate adaptation of a comic book to film that I have ever seen. Sure, the costumes are different. And it's like a thing that fanboys do. But folks, that is just about it for me. Harry would go on to write a whole second review of X-Men, only to lavish more praise. But not only that, he also hit fans of comic books, as well as movie producers, with what amounts to basically a ransom note. It isn't perfect, but damn, it's close enough. It's a start in the absolute right fucking direction. And if this movie makes money and it moves forward, then you know what? We might never see another fucking Batman and Robin embarrassment. Perhaps Hollywood will realize that you can invest more than $100 in this type of film and make something great beyond all belief. What you're hearing now is not an example of film criticism. It was what would later be called film enthusiasm. Film enthusiasm is a catch-all phrase that would describe the writing of many online movie journalists and bloggers like Harry Knowles. Using the threat of more films like Joel Schumacher's Batman and Robin as leverage, Harry is basically saying to support this film for the betterment of a burgeoning Marvel universe. Yes. Yes. What is that? What do the, the kids say? Yes, queen. Yes, queen. Right? Isn't that amazing? Have, is, have you heard that, Brian? Did you make it that far? Oh yeah, I've listened to this whole episode. I love. I mean, I'm I'm just started re-listening to the, the beginning. I mean, I I was blown away by this. Like, um, and, I mean, because again, again, I feel the, guy, the same the, the way. The reporter here. I mean, he he he's so fair. Um, I mean, he likes these movies that he's talking about. Here. He's not like us or like me. I'll, I'm not going to talk for Brian. Like, I hate these Marvel movies, but this guy likes them, and I don't know. Even I, I just really like this. I interrupted you. Sorry. No, no, I was going to say the same thing. We're, we're on the same page here. I, I probably, I do definitely like a superhero story a little probably more than you. But I just, I just want a good story. Like, I do think there's too many made. That, that's my big thing. And I, I think it, it waters down our, our content and our story. And I think we dumb it down to make it, like, I, listen, man, here's the problem I have. They're making a new Blade m- movie. It's going to be a PG-13. How do you have a vampire killer Oh, really? You know, Pete. Well, it's a it's a Marvel movie. It's PG thirteen. Oh. Think of all the stuff that goes up. Moon Knight. Everyone I like keeps the Blade movies. Me, everyone that keeps telling me about this Moon Knight, you know, oh, it's scary. It, that does not uh, come. Violent, it's does... this. It's that. Well, it can't be that much. It's on. You know, it's on Disney. It's it's PG thirteen, which I'm fine with. I'm not. I'm not. But for you know, don't tell me how adult it is when it's it's a PG thirteen thing. Like you know what I mean. That to me is not. It's adult. on the Disney. You know, the boys is adult. 
the, the, the boys as adults. And I'm anxiously, I cannot wait for the new season of the boys. There, see, we don't hate all things superhero. No. This next clip I just titled You Bastards <laughs> Ruined Movies by Pushing Comic Book Cinema. Make one thing clear. What Drew and the rest of the team at Ain't It Cool News accomplished in terms of shepherding comic book cinema to where it is today is significant. By leading this discourse, Ain't It Cool News helped to convince major studios to treat comic book movies seriously. And boy, have they. Big time. But whether the team of Ain't It Cool News intended this or not, by attempting to motivate studios by way of film enthusiasm and hype, they created an infinite feedback loop. As Ain't It Cool News rallied for comic book movies that were increasingly loyal to their source material, studios gave them what they wanted. More than that, according to Patrick Sorrell, creator of the internet movie news website Coming Attractions, the studios began to include these websites in their official marketing campaigns. I started getting movie studios yeah. actually saying, okay, we'll, we'll give you this stuff. And that was, that was when it kind of changed when they, somebody sat down and said, you know, there might be an audience here and we can actually use this in some type of way. Yeah. So talk about a feedback loop. So you got, you got like the, the real critics have disappeared. I mean, the ones that went, went through a, like some type of training system where you adhere to a code of ethics, of, you know, that's part of your yeah. job or you get fired and you're replaced with people who are like, woo, I'm going to be in a blurb. But it's also payola. They start bringing them to the places. They yeah. like it's it's just payola. Like and, and listen, I, I you know, I, I've seen this like I've seen like, oh, you better be, be on your best behavior on set today. We have press, but it's, you know, bloggers, you know, be, you know, answer their questions, you know, be enthusiastic. This next clip is called Intellectual Property, You Bastards Ruined Movies. <laughs> For online film journalism, there was motivation to become less about discovering movies based on new and original ideas. In other words, they became more devoted to creating content inspired by the intellectual property audiences already knew and loved. Yes. Yes, Queen. According and to Renee Rodriguez. Again. I know. Go oh, you got, more, you got more clip? Uh, there's like a minute more. Yeah, play but... the clip. I'm sorry. No, you can say what you're going to say. I'll well, go no, back. here's my thing. I, I know we can, you know, we always lose the argument because, oh, all these Marvel movies make money. All this makes money. Well, I have friends that are trying to make movies, original movies. And because of all this IP, they're there. If, if they even get a chance to make those movies, it's they're smaller and smaller. And I do think their movies. Sure. You know, I do think half the movies I worked on and, and these movies that these people want to make could give something would be enjoyed. You know, maybe with a little bit more money, but come hell or high water, they're still going to make those movies, but they they can't compare to all this IP. All that IP gets so much goddamn money. Oh my god! And there's only me, so much money available, and yes, you end up it makes sucking me all the money. Infuriating, sucking up all the money. It, you know, it may it's so infuriating to me that that's where we're at. Again, it's all corporate. See, that's what I mean. I'm just fighting against the man. So anyone that says I'm an idiot because I like Arkansas. Well, screw you. I'm standing up for your rights. I'm fighting the man. I'm, it's, the, it's the good fight. Norma Ray. Despite all the bluster and so-called democratization of media that the internet movie news sites were supposed to represent, the pursuit of audience engagement became more important than the writing or the films themselves. With, I mean, one of the, one of the big changes, well, the big change that uh, the internet brought to film coverage is it became a click count thing. In the world of online film journalism, the movies that resulted in less engagement got less coverage. And in some cases, no coverage whatsoever. And don't get me wrong. I love articles, blog posts, and especially podcasts about comic book movies and comic book TV shows. Shoutouts to Mark Benarden, Jason Concepcion, Van Lathan, Mallory Rubin, and Charles Holmes for bringing it every week. At the same time, I miss living in a world where there was a cinema culture that could get us just as excited about other kinds of movies. Drew McQueenie shares this feeling. I think the message they took was that's all we want. And that's certainly not the case. And this is where my argument with Harry really boiled down to. We should have told them we wanted more. Like for me, City of God was just as exciting as The Iron Giant. Like finding City of God, the first time I saw that, I was like, oh my God, that's what an experience. What an insane thing just happened to me in a room. Our site should have been about both. It should have really pushed for a greater sense of independent voices, a greater breadth of voices. Oh, I wish I had this. Sylvester Stallone Copland quote or 
blurb right now where he goes, you blow it. <laughs> where De Niro tells him, you blow it. That last guy was a writer for uh, Ain't It Cool News. Well, I previously, in a previous episode, I said they were all hacks and bums. Like, I, I never read the site. I just assumed that. But I guess uh, a, a couple of them went in to uh, make movies, write screenplays, or be in production roles. And a couple of them are, you know, entered and have established themselves as principled uh, entertainment journalists. So just, this is the last clip from this particular podcast. And I know like, this is something new and weird we're doing, but, uh, this last one is from, it goes back to Betsy, the movie critic, who I think we might've heard. I mean, she yep. might've been the, actually, did we hear her already? I don't know. But anyway, she was a uh, critic who her reviews got picked up by, uh, the AP wire and they were in newspapers all over the country. And I just think she makes a great, summation of an argument that I'm too dumb to express myself, but here she is. And for Betsy Pickle, who is not a fan of comic books or graphic novels, it's safe to say her feelings go beyond that. I've never liked comic books and I've never been interested in graphic novels. So I'm just out of the mainstream. I yeah. Mean, I, I accept that. I think it's fine to be out of the mainstream. I'm fine with that, but don't, take away the things that I like to enjoy. And I feel like that's what they've been doing. They've been sucking the air out of the film industry. Yeah, Betsy. I just thought she was awesome. You still there, Brian? Oh, I yeah. Yeah, anymore, I am. Right? Uh, I am still here. I thought that was a very I remember listening to that earlier and I was like, yes, that's exactly it. I'm not you don't we don't have to agree on movies, but I am damn sure that the movies that I love are starting to shrink. And also the movies I'm finding, I am watching more TV. And well, because, that's yes. And, and it's, and again, I was not a huge TV guy, but I am finding I'm more of a TV guy because the, the, the format is, you know, the, the storytelling is happening there. I am not seeing, you know, the Sydney Lumet died. You know what I'm trying to say? Like he took, you know, we're not going to get, uh, you know, Serpico Serpico. We're not going to get afternoon. before the devil Network. knows you're de uh, do, you know, dead, you know, like uh, watching that the other day. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And it what also bothers me, like there is good stuff out there. But again, coming back to what opened this podcast, people aren't talking about it. Like no. you've got all right, the wire. I get it. People miss the wire. We all sort of miss the wire. I mean, Listen. I saw it a couple episodes in, but now it's like, oh, you got the spiritual sequel to it. And everyone's just totally ignoring it because Paul Schrader she -Hulk, said she Hulk is out oh, or coming out. OK, we're going to talk about that. Dr. Strange part two. We're going to talk about that instead. Get Paul, out of here. Paul Schrader said John Berthenall plays the best villain he's seen in years. I saw that, too. Yeah. yeah Paul like, come yeah. on, man. That's. And he was a film. I, no, he was. he. A film yes, he critic? was. Yes. He was yeah, a film yeah. critic. All right. He was a great, a great like him and Peter you know, Bogdan like Bogdanovich. Like, yeah. Watch that. Watch that show. Like, and that's the other thing. Don't come at me that I don't know what I'm talking about until you watch that show. Exactly. Yeah. And all these people. that And again, read. like, like, what were you doing in college? Like in college, like I was so lonely commuting to school uh, every day. I'd have hours to kill and I'd go into my stupid library and I would seek out the old dusty film criticism of Paul Schrader, of Peter Bogdanovich, of that old film war encyclopedia. Uh, and then like going into horror conventions where they have all these weird books like that, the feminist take on I spit on your grave yeah. and all that stuff. People should be reading all that stuff. Give it up with the well, Marvel. Hey, and the you want to talk books. about like wokeness and all this stuff in, in movies. And that's what drives me nuts. People don't watch, you know, we own this city, which is it's all like some of the best performance. There's a mix of everything in there. That's what you're missing too. Like, and it's not perfect. Like, it's not. We're no, not saying not. this is. Yeah, but, but like the fact that people really don't talk good. about it and they're just ignoring it is just bizarre. What world are we living in nowadays? And I guess like I have random notes here, and like we talked about this a lot when we used to have Glenn on. We would Glenn Baisley, an independent yeah. filmmaker, and he's doing a ton of uh, work on uh, like Vinegar Syndrome, behind the scenes stuff, and Shout Factory, and whatever else uh, he's doing. But like we would always argue with them because we would talk about a movie like the Star Wars, you know, when the new Star Wars movies came out and he would like, but no, but then this thing and then this thing and in this episode and that's not canon. And then so we would always be like, you know, oh, well, look, a movie should be a standalone thing. Yeah. You should not have to read a thousand comic books and novels to watch a movie. That's not what a movie should be. Is the story. If you have to do that, you have a weak story. Yes. But now 
that has been accepted. And that's what sort of bums me out. Like, not only do you have to know like the comic book stuff and all the references to really fully enjoy it. Now you you have have to watch watch a TV show. Yes. You have to watch through, I guess this, uh, I guess I'm finding out Dr. Strange, which I mean, I'll see eventually when it's free, you know, I have to watch WandaVision. Exactly. Now. And I, I think even the viewers, even the people who are, maybe they're more open-minded, I don't know, but they're willing to put in the time, the people who are willing willing to put in the time to do some of this stuff, I feel like maybe they've reached their limit with some of this. And I'm talking about Dr. Strange 2 particularly, because there is a brand new podcast out there. It's called Recent Activity. It is hosted by three guys, one of whom is the guy that used to host the NOMCAST, Okay. who I don't think he's ever been on, but we met him at the CT well, Horror uh, Fest. Yes. Andrew Morgan. And then uh, Chris Frodell, I might be mispronouncing his name. Uh, he's the writer. I have one of his pens. Then the name of the of his website escapes me at the moment. You know what I'm talking about? And he's I so do, she's yeah. friends I, with I, the I, pint yeah. guys. Yes, yes. I know all, I don't know. You know, you know me. I don't listen to all, the, the podcast. World, arguing but. with myself. Arguing with myself. Okay. That's that's the name of his uh, website. And the third guy is uh, Mosh Media. I, I, I think it's Mosh Media. Chris Beauregard? Bur- Beauregard, I think his name is. Anyway, so uh, if you, they, they did, that podcast just launched. I'm sorry, I'm falling over my own words. But if you listen to their review of Doctor Strange, like it's like they're talking about a pack of cigarettes. You know, you have to know all this, like, because, because it's, and I say that because it's product they're talking about. Doctor Strange to me doesn't seem like a movie. It's not a self contained movie. It's this new product you have to have some familiarity with to really get yes. the full effect. You have to like know how to use it. It has, to, you have to have, it has to have a set of instructions with it for, in order for you to enjoy it. And I sort of pointed this out out to them uh in their podcast and i guess i'll just i'll just because they they agree like they're and it's interesting to hear them so i'm gonna play this one part do i have it set up here hopefully this is the beginning of their podcast where they're just in just to introduce the topic of dr strange how many loops the host andrew morgan is forced to jump through to get into the discussion War has really ushered into the era of the Marvel content universe. He's talking phase four. I cut out the word. I cut out the word phase. Okay. Into the Marvel Cinematic Universe, where it's just one big continuous story between two very different mediums, or so one would hope. Uh, and I think, like I said, that's a good place to start this conversation, as this movie in particular is more of a byproduct of this shift in content and canon more than any other MCU film before it. Uh, so let's begin with a general discussion of Phase 4. Uh, and Chris, I'm going to start with you, because I think you and I, after we saw this movie, had a very fruitful conversation of kind oh, yeah. of where this whole universe is going, um, or multiverse is going, or any of these things, mm-hmm. trying to figure out really what is Phase 4 besides essentially just the building of Disney+. Plus. I, I mean, I'm just like that conversation yeah. to me, it's just... It's you can't even review the movie because there's so much baggage it comes with. Well, then I just then found then that fascinating. You're saying phase four, as opposed to movies. You know what I mean? That's the thing. I don't get it. Like I'm, and these guys. I, what 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 I really like about that uh, that clip is that these are guys who, like I said, they put the time in. They have an open mind, and and I I assume they like a bunch of the old Marvel stuff. So they're like. They're there. They're along for the ride. And even they're like, what? This is too much. And on Twitter, I did tweet to them because I listened to that first part and I just had to like throw off the tweet to them. I was like, every Doctor Strange review sort of starts off with a discussion, putting the film into some type of context, which I see as a fundamental flaw of these type of flicks. And they said right back to me, absolutely. Our review says as much. Hell, our title says as much. We called it WandaVision season two. Now, yeah, uh. which so they, they were negative. But what also tickles me is that I never watched WandaVision, right? So I don't know what they mean by we call it WandaVision season two. But 
that's how far afield these superhero movies at MCU and the Disney Channel have become because you don't have an individual experience with it. It's to the point where you can't even recognize negative, like criticism of these stuff. <laughs> Because I don't know, I didn't. I never. What do you mean, Wandavision season two? That's how just sort of upside down we are at this point uh, in filmdom. I so. took my nephew to see one of those Spider-Man movies. The one where they all get together. I listen. No, 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 not that one. Because it was okay. pre-COVID, and okay. uh, it was where I guess I didn't know Tony Stark died in one of those Avengers. You know what I mean? And the whole movie starts. Even, okay, yeah, yeah. The whole movie starts and he's dead already. And me and my nephew, you know, like I, you know, I, I cash, I watch all this stuff when it's free. You know what I mean? By the time it hits me, I'm unless it's something I'm very, you know, excited about. I think old man Wolverine, I wanted to see, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, but like, cause again, you know, I don't know why oh, yeah, I saw I, old man Wolverine. Yeah, yeah, that was pretty good. Also, but the one great. movie that none of these quote unquote superhero look like unbreakable. That was to me one of the greatest superhero movies. M Night Shyamalan's yeah. you know, Unbreakable. Yeah, good movie. And no I one brings it. that up, and that was and that was a superhero movie, but it didn't need all this IP. But that's forgotten. You know what I mean? Right, because yeah. it's not IP. Yeah. So, but anyway, you know, I guess that's the episode. You know, we could go. Uh, we've talked about like the soullessness of it and all that kind of stuff. But I just wanted to. I I thought like instead of me just ranting about it. I just wanted to use the, uh, I thought, well thought out, well researched and well said statements and interviews that have been featured in Download, The Rise and Fall of Harry Knowles and Ain't It Cool News uh, by the dude who, I don't know, where is his name again? What was his name? Joe Smith. Joe Scott. Yeah, Joe, Joe Scott. Scott. So a shout out to Joe Scott out there. And I guess the podcast came out, I think, earlier this year. We're sort of late on this. But please, if you like uh, Marvel stuff or you don't like Marvel stuff, either way, listen to this podcast. Uh, it's very good. So I, I guess that's it, Brian. Yeah, I don't know it. what else uh, to say other than uh, I'm Carlos Danger. And uh, that's Brian Spears. Hey. And this was insufferable bastards we'll see you next time later now the music will play